Okay, Alyssa, take us away. Oh, did you want to finish what you were saying about the template? You can say it. All right, so um, unfortunately we lost some graphics in our upload, so um, this doesn't look to the participants exactly the way that it's supposed to. Um, Jen, is there a place we can post this so they can get their hands on the actual presentation? Yeah, I'll post it to Dropbox while we're um, while we're going over our material, and um, and then I'll send everybody the link. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah. All right. So we are here today to talk about um, completing grant applications for the 2015-2016 faculty learning community grants. And before we introduce ourselves and get started, um, we're just going to run through just a couple things here. Uh, the first thing is, as you're logging in, if you haven't already, please go ahead and check your audio. And your audio can be found in the tools menu, and you just need to run your audio setup wizard. Most of you have probably already done that, but if you haven't, go ahead and take a minute and do that now. All right, so just a few quick tips on our meeting interface. If you're not familiar with Blackboard, collaborate. Uh, these are the different pieces of it. You'll see, um, if someone's using a webcam, you'll see their um, video in the upper left corner. Right now you're just seeing my picture there because I don't have my web webcam on. There's um, a participants area that shows a list of everyone who is logged into our session. At the far bottom left corner, there is a chat that the group can use to chat. Lots of you are already doing that. There's a toolbar there in the middle that we probably won't be using today, but just so that you know that it's there in case you're moderating a session with students in the future. Um, those tools are there for you. And where you're seeing the slides display right now is the whiteboard area. All right, so in the participant tools, uh, there's some different things that you can do. There's emoticons. You can show yourself as stepping away from the session. When you'd like to speak, please raise your hand and we'll call on you in order. There's a polling feature. I don't think we're going to be using that today. You can see which features are enabled uh, next to your profile for what's um, available for you to use. And then just remember that when you see the um, little blue microphone next to your name, that means that your talk button is on. And if you're not actually speaking at that time, it is um, a good idea to go ahead and turn that button off so that we don't hear background noise. Okay, moving on. Um, again, there's that chat window. Go ahead and type in questions and comments as we go. We'll revisit those as the session is going. And then um, here's an overview of what we're going to do. If you're just barely joining us and logging in, uh, there's a note at the bottom for you there to run your audio setup wizard and um, the path to get there. So today we're going to start with introductions and an overview of the session. That's what we'll do next. Then we'll move on to the grant timeline. We'll talk about um, an OGMS overview, the FLC overview, and a budget overview. So you're going to get lots of good information today. You'll probably be a little overloaded, but all the information will be available to you, all the files. And um, then, of course, we're all going to be available to answer questions for you. All right, so um, this is us. Um, this is how you can contact us. Uh, we have Jennifer Wetham here today. She's a program administrator for faculty development. And I'm Alyssa Sells. I'm the program administrator for e-learning and open education. I am Jennifer's um, faculty development twin. So she de deals with the assessment, teaching, and learning side. And I deal with um, e-learning related things. And um, then also today joining us, we have Michelle Rockwell, who is a contract specialist. And she's here to give us some great budget information and to help answer budget questions. And then we have um, Shannon Bell, who is a secretary senior. And um, she is going to be your expert for um, how to use OGMS and um, questions along those lines. So thank you, ladies, everyone, for um, joining us today to help us get this information out. And thank you to our participants who've logged in to uh, join in the session. All right, Jen, you want to go ahead with the timeline? Yeah, thanks, Alyssa, for that yep. lovely introduction. And um, thank you to those of you who are taking time from your busy schedules to log on. We really appreciate you being here. So uh, as of today, April 23rd, 
uh, the FLC applications are now open in OGMS, and Secretary Senior Shannon Bell will be giving us some content around the details, nuances, and intricacies. 521, uh, May 21st, applications will be due um, at 11.55 p.m. We will only be available until 5 p.m. for assistance, so please make a note of that in your schedules. Uh, early June, we will be giving grant feedback available in OGMS, and mid-June is when any required modifications are due and that will be flexible based on when you get your feedback and how complex that feedback is. On Ju uh, July 1st, 2015, the grants will be released. And that's it for our timeline. So with that, um, I'm going to let Shannon and Michelle talk to us a little bit about OGMS Access. Hi, thanks, thanks, Jen. Um, this is Michelle, and Shannon, um, while she is very good at um, answering your OGMF questions, she's brand new to um, giving a, an overall um, spiel about OGMF, so I'm going to do that for her today. Perfect. Um, and then she's going to be an expert in that as well. <laughs> um, so as Jen mentioned, um, the grant application is now live in OGMF. Um, and in order to access OGMS, you have to have a user account. College OGMS security administrators create OGMS accounts. Uh, state board staff cannot create college user accounts, uh, but, but your college can do that for you. If you don't know who your security contact is, there is a tab in OGMS um, before you even log before you even log in. It's, it's on any of the, the home screen of OGMS that will list every college and their security contacts. Um, every college should have at least two security contacts, so if somebody's out of the office, you ought to be able to reach another person. Um, the orange arrow on the screen right now shows who that shows shows where you'll find the security contacts. Incidentally, um, also on the screen right next to the security contacts tab, you see a how to button, um, tab, button, whatever you want to call it. I highly recommend going to this screen as well because there's a user manual on that screen. Um, it's really helpful user manual. It's got lots of screenshots in it. It's going to walk you through um, everything that we talk about today and, and a whole lot more. Uh, so make sure you go there, consult that, especially if you're having a problem, if something's not working right, um, go to the user manual, look it up, uh, see if that solves your problem. So can we go? Oh, no, not um, it's entirely possible that your college has a process where only certain staff, typically grants office or business office staff, have access to OGMS um, by, by design, and that's, we, we don't dictate each college's process. Um, so if that's the case, those staff at your college will work with you to write and submit the application. Regardless of the process though, at your college, it is extremely important to work closely with your grant staff. Um, maybe They may be staff in, in a grant office or maybe staff in your business office. Those people, I mean, work closely with them. They're going to be your best friends throughout this whole process, or they should be. Um, even if you already have a, an OGMS user account at your college, you still have to contact your, your college's OGMS security administrator to get access to the 2015-16 um, FLC application. Access to last year's application, if you had it, does not carry over because this year's application is a whole new application in the, in the system. Um, or if you're at a school where uh, grants office staff submits the application for you, still go to those staff um, and let them know about this year's application. So on the OGMS login screen, um, it, it, there is a forgot my password. If you did have access last year and you're still supposed to have access and you've gotten you know, access to the actual application from your security administrator, but maybe it's been a year since you used the system and you forgot your username and your password, um, you can go to the screen and use the retrieve my password um, link. You do need to know your username 
to do your retrieve password, you're going to enter your username, and then the system's going to email your password to you. Your username may be first initial last name. If that doesn't work, contact your security administrator. While they probably don't have access to your password, they do have access to your username. They can look up your username for you. So when you enter in your username, you're going to get an email in about 30 seconds, maybe two minutes at the most with your password in it. If you don't get that email in about two minutes time, check your spam or your junk folder. And if after a few minutes you still don't even see that email in your spam folder, go back to your security person to make sure that the email address associated with your user account is correct. A lot of times we have schools over the past few years that have changed their email addresses and email formats, and, and schools don't necessarily remember to update all of their users in OGMS. So sometimes that's the case where the email is getting sent, it's just going to a bad email address that doesn't exist anymore. So once you have access to OGMS and to the and to this year's the, the 2015-16 FLC grant application, you can create a new grant application um, in the available grant section of OGMS. There's a screenshot of that now. Um, once you have access to it, you'll see it there. You'll click on the um, create new application button next to it, and that brings up the a brand new blank application that you're going um, to use to fill out. You're only going to do that creating an application once, because after you've created it, it's in there. Um, but anytime you log into OGMS, by default, OGMS is going to put you in the current fiscal year. We're currently in fiscal year 2015 or FY15. Um, you're applying for a grant in FY16. So after you've started your grant application, anytime you save it and go back into OGMS, you're going to have to, by default, OGMS is going to put you on the FY15 screen. But you're going to see a, a, a little row of uh, links, I guess you want to call it, with each of the fiscal years on it. And you're going to want to click into FY16. And then you'll see your um, grant that you've already started and saved and that's in process. Um, if you don't see it there, and you don't see it anywhere, if you don't see it under the available grants, or if you don't see the one you already started, contact your college's OGMS security administrator. They'll help you see it. Um, and if they still can't help you see it, there's a problem, then give Shannon a call. But probably it's just a permissions issue that they, they have to solve on their end at your school. OGMS also has a feature, um, it's a security feature built into it, where the system will time out after 20 minutes of inactivity. OGMS only counts clicking the Save button and clicking from one screen to another as activity. Typing doesn't count as activity. Neither does clicking checkboxes or radio buttons, um, which is why if you have longer, uh, longer text, answers that you're going to type, we recommend maybe you type them in Word first and then copy and paste them in. The good news is that they're at the 15 minute mark, OGMS has a pop-up window that comes up and lets you know you need to save or you'll be logged out. Um, and, and you're going to lose, if you get logged out, you're going to lose anything that you haven't already saved um, or anything that you've done since the last time you saved which is um, devastating if you've typed a bunch of stuff in there. If that happens, um, click the back button on your browser, go back in, go back in your stuff, copy it out of, you know, copy it out of there, put it in Word, log back in, copy it out of Word, put it back in. If, if you catch it in time, you can do that. Um, the bad news is so that some, some browsers will block that pop-up window that comes up at the 15-minute mark. If your browser doesn't block it, though, it never fails if that 15-minute reminder comes up while you're away from your desk every single time. Or maybe it's just me that experiences that. I get, I get that thing on a daily basis. I get logged out. Um, and it's frustrating. But I do appreciate the security feature of that. So the first, the first um, section you're going to come to is the, app, the applicant info screen. Here's where you're going to type in um, contact info for the grant. Both of these contacts that you list here will get uh, emails from OGMS, but only the first contact listed will get the official award email from OBIS. OBIS is our uh, 
Open oh, Systems System where after a grant be really becomes a grant, after an application is approved and it becomes a grant, um, OBIS is where the, the, the grant actually lives on. Um, and OBIS will send the official award email. But OBIS is only capable of one contact, so only that person that goes in that primary contact. So make sure your primary contact is the person who's responsible for that grant all year long. Um, it's entirely possible that your college will require you to put someone from your grants office or your business office in either the primary or the secondary contact field. So check with them about this to make sure that uh, you've got some, you know, that you uh, have a contact in there that they need you to have in there. Also be very careful when you're entering your email addresses. Um, there's no, you see there's only one box for each email. There isn't a enter your email and then verify that it's correct in another box. So if you have a typo in your email, you're not going to get any of the notifications from OGMS. And that could be very bad because you're not going to get the notification that says, that hopefully says your grant has been approved. Or if we actually need you to make some kind of modification, OGMS will send you an automated notice saying we need you to make a change, and you won't get that either if you have a typo. So really double check those emails, make sure you don't have typos in them. So on the next, oops, perfect. Um, once you get into your application itself, you're going to see a couple of a couple of great things on the page. Towards the right side of the slide that's on the screen right now, you see the orange arrow that points to the grant info link. It's not really a button, it's just a little link. That's where you're going to find um, things like the uh, grant guidelines and the fiscal grant fiscal guidelines. Go there, look through those documents. Um, those have all of the uh, what you can and can't do with your grant, um, timelines, deadlines, all of those, all of those good rules that you're going to need to know uh, to fill out your grant. Those documents live there all year long, so if you you don't necessarily need to save them somewhere, you can come back. You can always log back in and go back into your application and find them there as well. Um, the assurances tab on the can we go back a slide? Yeah, thank you. Um, you'll notice that the assurances tab, which is the first, which with the first orange arrow, the one on the left is pointing to, you see it's, it's got a little check mark on it. Hopefully you can see that on your screen. Um, this application doesn't actually require assurances. The assurances are already are built into the, the content questions of your application. So you don't have to do this section. And as such, OGMS is smart enough to know that essentially you're already done with it. And it puts a little check mark there. Anytime, anytime you mark a section as complete, it'll have a check mark so that you know it's complete. So uh, you've already started your application, and look, that whole section's already done. It, um, there are actually eight sections of content in this application. The first seven are grant content sections. Um, the last section, section eight, is budget narrative. You can click through each section on the sections tab. So once you go into the contents, you're going to see this whole little row of this whole new row of buttons, the buttons, tabs, whatever you want to call it, that comes across your screen. And you'll see all eight sections of them, which you can click through them all. Next to the the top right arrow is pointing at that uh, the top left arrow. Sorry, apparently I didn't know my left and my right today. Top left arrow is pointing at that at that row of buttons. At the bottom of every screen of every one of these sections, um, once you answer the content, or even if you only answer one question, you still scroll down to the bottom. There is a save button. Um, there is a check to mark as complete button, a little box, or a reset button. Save obviously saves your answers. And remember, clicking the save button is one of only two things that counts as activity in the system. So make sure you click that save button at least every 20 minutes, if not more frequently. Um, the reset button will actually reset your answers to the last time you saved. Um, so it may actually end up wiping out all your answers. So be careful, you know, not to click that if you don't really want to. And the check to mark is complete. Once you complete a section, check that little box and then click the save button. That's what puts the little check mark on, at the, uh, at the top of your screen to show you that you're done. And the, uh, orange arrow on the bottom right. Um, it's pointing at a completed section with a check mark, and you see like sections two and three there haven't been completed, so they don't have that little check mark, check mark, check mark on them. This gives you, this just, you know, gives you at a quick glance how much of your application you've done and how much you still have to do. Um, you don't have to complete the sections in order. 
And even if you mark a section as complete, you can still go back and change it as long as you haven't already submitted the application. Just be sure to click the Save button again after you make any changes. So at this point, um, Jen and Alyssa are going to uh, walk you through um, what makes a successful FLC. And so their content will help you fill in the narrative questions in sections one through seven of your application. And when they're finished, we'll talk about the budget and the budget narrative for your grant application. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks so much. So Alyssa and I are going to talk about what makes a successful FLC. And given the sake, for the sake of time, this is going to be pretty high level. Um, we've broken it down into accessing the grant information, um, what we would like to do to support facilitators, forming he healthy FLCs. Um, which is what our grant criteria is grounded in. So Hana, I know you had asked that you had said you wanted to find out what you know the criteria is, and this is um, what it's rooted in. So we'll talk a little bit about that and give you some further reading. Um, Alyssa will talk about the State Board's open learning policy, our open policy, and um, our commitment to uh, Creative Commons licensing and sharing learning. And then finally, we'll talk about our attempts to make the evaluation process not just formative, but also transparent. So the first piece would be accessing the grant information. And I am going to take you on a desktop tour for a second. So for, uh, bear with me while we open up, while I share my desktop with you. And can I just get um, a thumbs up or a smiley face or something along those lines if you can see my screen right now? Um, Bess gave it a check. Uh, Bridget gave me a hands up. OK. And Alyssa has just included the link. And I'm going to show you what to do in case you can't remember what the link is. If you just type in SBCTC FLC, um, our grant will come up first. So you can access the grant guidance using this link. And you can also see the fiscal guidelines broken down here. And we'll be returning to this page um, in a little bit. But first, I just wanted to show you how to access the grant, uh, in case you forgot or lost the um, URL. OK, and now I am going to stop sharing. Sorry, I'm, I'm not super good at sharing my desktop smooth, smoothly and seamlessly. We're going to go back to our slide deck. So um, can everyone now see the slide, de the slide about mand our mandatory facilitator workshop? So again, if I could just, OK, good, I can see things. So right now, a little box should have popped up in your window that says Alyssa Sells has sent you the file, uh, Fiscal Year 16 FLC Grant Guidance Final. And when it asks you, do you wish to save it, click Yes. And this will give you your very own copy of the grant guidance. Um, so please go ahead and, and click Yes and download that. So our mandatory facilitator workshop for funded FLCs will be held September 10th to 11th in 2015. And we are going to hold that at the SBCTC Bellevue office. Um, one of the things that we have realized with the FLCs is that their facilitation can make or break them, and also that facilitating is not just a science, but also an art. We're also Alyssa and I are also very co committed to creating faculty leaders in our system and creating um, leaders who are well versed and practiced in the art of facilitation and having them mentor other FLC leaders is very, very important to us. So um, it, we have in this virtual room Mark Lentini, who is one of our most valued facilitators. And so um, we're hoping to tap into the wisdom of folks like Mark and have them 
mentor and and guide our new facilitators. We also, um, I'm, I'm new to this position as is Alyssa, this will, I'm just coming up on my second year and I didn't know much about FLC facilitation before I started it, in this position and there is so much, there's a wealth of information to discuss. So last year we had the mandatory facilitator workshop online in late October. The overwhelming feedback we received was that it came too late um, for faculty to actually apply it um, or for the facilitators to actually apply it and that they wanted, they wanted it earlier and they wanted it face to face and that they wanted it to be about more conceptual topics as opposed to more um, practical sort of nuts and bolts like working with your grants office. So, um, we, so we decided, uh, we picked September 10th and 11th because um, we, our new faculty institute is the third and fourth and the e-learning facilitate, the e-learning, new e-learning council training is the weekend after and, or the Thursday, Friday after and then the week after that, the first week of classes start. So we recognize that some of your faculty may be off contract, that some of your faculty may be newly on contract and doing things that they are obligated to do for the institution. And so if that is the case, we would ask that you either send a member of your FLC who you want to grow as a faculty leader or as just a leader on your campus who could report back to the larger group and share that knowledge. But it is important to us to have at least one person from every FLC at this workshop um, for crowdsourcing, for sharing of information, for learning about what other FLCs are doing. I, I cannot speak enough um, about the power of this workshop. And Alyssa and I will be sort of the lead facilitators, but we'll be asking for volunteers to help us lead workshops. and. Um, Beth writes, is it still required for the college submissions come from a staff or faculty who has completed Shoreline's FLC course? Um, Beth, that's a great question. No, it is not required that the submissions come from a staff or faculty member who has completed that course. I see Debbie is typing. Um, Deb, please feel free to just, just continue to type. Um, and Jim, I see that you are trying to speak, but it looks like your mic is out. There might be a delay. So if you feel comfortable typing your, your question into the chat window, that would be fine. And we can stop and pause for people to type their questions into the chat window, and we can address those now because I'm assuming they're about the facilitator training. And Beth, there is a larger, more complex answer to your question, um, but I'll I'll save it and respond. You know, just because it's probably extra, it's probably extra information. Oh, oh, Jim said I wasn't trying to speak. I'm experiencing leg issues. Okay, I completely understand. Um, I see Hera is still typing. Um, I think maybe for the sake of time, Hera, I'll let you continue to type, and Deb, you too. So please just feel free to continue typing. But I am going to move on to the forming a healthy FLC while we wait for those questions. So um, you'll see in Appendix C that we have a life cycle of a healthy faculty learning community. And I'll be flipping over to that in just a few moments. Um, and we also, these, these criteria are what we grounded our, um, this life cycle, I'm sorry, is what we grounded our application process in uh, so that the application process would be formative but in the sense that it would be helping designers, whoever submits the application, to be thinking about pieces that we know from experience make healthy FLCs. And this, these criteria were derived from our 2012 faculty learning community evaluation. Um, led by Maureen Pettit, Stan Gotu, and um, there's a third author, uh, Benjamin Mole from Corbin University. So I'm going to move over to document sharing again, or desktop sharing. You're going to see my desktop. And um, I'm just going to show you, 
you'll see on our web page, Faculty Learning Communities Scholarly Works. And that is where you can find this project evaluation, as well as assessment of FLCs, uh, considering the social dimensions of participant choice, which is an excellent article about um, assessing the success of your FLC, among other things. And all of these people are very approachable, in addition to being amazing scholars. They're also very approachable, and they would be happy to talk to you about their research, and especially about their methodologies. So I'm going to flip down to Appendix C. Sorry about this. Appendix C. Here we are. And OK, there it is. And this life cycle, these 12 tips for developing and sustaining a successful faculty learning community are based on this evaluation, as I said. And they are, here they are right here. Uh, collaboratively propose clear, short, and long-term goals and desired outcomes. Collaboratively develop an assessment plan that will help you measure progress towards those goals. Establishing a shared framework, both conceptual and methodol and method wow, methodological. <laughs> I am very tired, apparently. I can't pronounce methodology. <laughs> um, and we can talk more. Um, if you're interested in understanding what that means, we can definitely talk more about that um, if people have questions. Allowing time and resources for participants to get comfortable. Striving for equitable and frequent communication. Um, really striving for internal and intrinsic motivation, but also providing incentives for organizers and participants. And when Michelle talks about budget categories, we'll talk a little bit more about what might be an incentive. Tapping into broader campus events and aligning with college-wide initiatives, this is very, very motivating for folks. As much as possible, and practical, collaborating across multiple disciplines and areas of the college and institutions. Encouraging interaction with outside expertise. This is very, very valuable and can also be incentive. Disseminating results within and beyond the college. Working with college leadership to encourage a culture which values and sustains the learning community. And then finally, taking the time and the steps to develop the next generation of FLC leaders. And again, Alyssa and I, in addition to designing the, the assessment process or the evaluation process around these things, we also have built these things into our actual grant. Um, and when Alyssa talks about our open policy, that she'll talk a little bit more about how we are um, trying to create um, sustainable FLCs that allow them to persist and transform and disseminating the results. And then also our FLC workshop is definitely about trying to develop this next generation of FLC leaders. So I am going to stop sharing my desktop. And I'm going to take us back to our slides. And I'm going to ask Alyssa to talk about uh, sharing our learning, which is a best practice. All right, so um, these four things here, learn, create, release, and share, um, the, they're the four most important pieces of your grant. Um, they're the grant, they form the grant expectations. Um, if you look in the grant expectations sections of the grant guidelines, there's an explanation of each of these. We're just going to briefly talk about them here real quick. So um, the first one here, we just say learn in the grant expectations. It's actually titled learn together. We're just trying to keep this slide simplified. So um, the primary goal of your FLC is um, to give you and your colleagues and all of the participants um, the time and space for professional learning in the hopes that it's going to deepen um, your individual and collective teaching practices with that end goal of fostering student learning. 
So um, it's really important that each FLC includes specific and measurable and observable participant outcomes. And those outcomes are going to drive all of your grant activities and your budget expenditures. So everything um, in your grant should come back to this learning process. And it's a learning process for the participants in the FLC. That's who the outcomes apply to. All right, the second one is create. And for create, you're going to create digital artifacts. So each FLC is tasked with developing a digital artifact that will in some way connect to the FLC outcomes that you're, that you're using and that is going to also serve as a resource for other educators. So digital artifacts can include a lot of things, um, and they're not limited in any way to the list I'm going to give you if your FLC comes up with a different or new version of a digital artifact, um, please feel free to explore other things. But here are some of the things that you might consider when you're creating a digital artifact. Uh, a canvas shell, uh, a website, any project planning documents or insight papers. Um, you might decide to produce audio, video, or other multimedia. Um, any type of learning object that can be shared out, um, policy documents, partnership agreements, um, modules, like content modules, um, rubrics, student assessments, surveys, data analysis, and um, any type of online course or program. So and as you can see, that, that list is pretty big. It's pretty long. There's a lot of different things that you can choose to create um, as your digital artifact. So, um, you know, explore that topic and decide um, what the best way to do that for your group is. Um, the third one down, release, is about releasing your um, learning openly and your artifacts openly. So um, this is what Jennifer was talking about earlier um, about the SBCTC open policy. So um, all work that's produced by the FLC um, falls under the SBCTC open licensing policy. And you can read that um, from within the grant guidelines. There's a link to it. You can actually go to the document that outlines this policy. But it basically says that beginning on July 1st of 2010, all educational resources and knowledge produced through competitive grants offered through or managed by SBCTC must carry a Creative Commons CC BY license. So um, that's really, really important. Um, for sharing this out because basically we're going to be asking you to give this out for other people to take and use for their own learning. Maybe they want to remix it. Maybe they want to adapt it. Maybe they want to change it and make something new out of it. But we do ask you to share um, that out and we do ask that you put a Creative Commons license on it. And um, we would recommend that at least one member of your FLC um, participates or takes the online training um, for how to use OER that is offered monthly through, um, actually I don't think it's monthly, um, but it is offered through the SBCTC e-learning staff. It's, it's usually taught by um, Bo Young Che. So um, that's a really important class to take. If no one on your team has taken it, it will give you an insight into uh, the importance of open licensing, what it is, how to create it, um, you know, how to put that license on it, how to choose the license, um, all sorts of good information there. And um, we've got some other great online tools that um, you'll learn about in the OER course. But if you go to openwa.org, that is um, a website that was developed uh, by the um, SBCTC eLearning Office. And um, it's basically a guide to open resources. And you can search for OER there. You can learn about OER there. And then my favorite tab on that website is the Attribution Builder. So if you are familiar with OER and um, you need to put some attributions, maybe you're going to do a presentation um, as part of your digital artifacts and you're using pictures, if you want to put your attributions on there, you can use the Attribution Builder to do that. So it's a, it's a really great resource. All right, and then the last one here is share. And um, we want you to share out the learning that occurs in your, in your faculty learning community. So um, you're going to be asked to um, 
come up with a plan for how you plan to disseminate your knowledge. Um, you know, you're going to share your expertise and you're going to share your experience. And um, that could be to colleagues, that can be to, um, you know, across your campus. Um, we also ask, um, hopefully, that you'll, you'll share out statewide so um, that it, it, we can all benefit from that. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, ways that you can choose to share out. These are just some different ideas. This doesn't mean you have to do it this way. Again, you know, you're, it's open to exploration for how you choose to share. Um, one way to share out your learning is to present at the Assessment Teaching and Learning Conference that's held annually. Um, next year, it's going to be in May of 2016, it will be held in Vancouver, Washington. Um, another place that is um, a great place to share out, especially if you are um, submitting a proposal for an e-learning focused grant, um, would be to present at the Northwest e-learning conference um, or at the Washington user group Canvas conference that um, is in the spring. So the user group, group conference is usually in the spring and the Northwest e-learning is either in October or November, so that one's in the fall. Um, and then, um, you know, you can work with us, um, Jennifer or I, to, you know, figure out other places that might be good venues for you to share. Um, we've got a little list um, in the grant guidelines for, um, you know, different retreats that are held. There's a fall and winter ATL retreat. Um, during the winter and spring, Jennifer and I run the IGNIS webinar series. So that's a possibility. We actually do have some of our 2015 FLCs who um, are choosing to share out and disseminate through um, the IGNIS webinars. At the same time, it makes their digital artifact because it's recorded. So you can, you know, get two birds with one stone there. Um, and then um, another example would be train the trainer workshops or one day drive-in type events. Um, an example of that would be um, Shoreline's accessibility retreat from this year. Uh, they they um, held a two-day retreat, I think it was in February, and um, participants from all over the state, it was open to everybody. So that was kind of neat. Um, Jen, anything else you want to add on to that before I move on to the rubric? Only that um, I think a lot about Sandy Shugart and his idea that the way that you change an institutional culture is by creating artifacts. And I really believe that that is the way that will shift the statewide culture as well. And, you know, there's a lot of inefficiencies, there's a lot of redundancies, there's a lot of is instructional issues that people want to share or want to learn about um, or want to handle. And I do want to say that um, Highline is a great example of this. Um, Allison Green is leading an FLC that's actually more like a community of practice where they're creating a can and I'm saying this one in particular not just because there's so many folks from Highline on here, but because one of the requests I get the most is how do we train and and develop faculty, or not just faculty, but staff around um, intercultural communication. And I know that Allison has been doing a tremendous body of work that as people are creating this canvas, these canvas modules around um, cultural responsiveness, not only are people learning about it um, through creating it, but it's going to be able to be shared widely when, of course, it's ready to be shared <laughs> um, so that other people don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, and we just saw another example of this from Allison um, Indrunas and Peg Belikowski at Everett. They have a module or a course um, to onboard new faculty and new staff. and um, and they mentioned it about the, the, that it was openly licensed and that they were willing to share it. And you could have seen, not only did I see a palpable shift in the room where people's shoulders went back, people's faces brightened, there was a palpable sense of relief, like, oh my gosh, there, here's something that's successful and I don't have to recreate the wheel and it's going to be really easy to share it because all I have to do is ask my e-learning director to help me access this uh, cartridge. I just think it's a beautiful time to be an educator. Okay, I'm done talking. 
<laughs> All right. Um, that's fine. No, that was a great addition. Um, that's what I love about you, Jen. You always have a little tidbit to add. <laughs> All right, so um, this is a slide about the rubric, and rather than read from this, I think I'm just going to screen share with y'all real quick and actually let you look at the rubric. So um, could you all just verify that you're seeing seeing the rubric now for me? Just give me a check. Okay, Jennifer gave me a smiley, so we're good to go. And I'm actually... I'm going to close down my chat window here. Ooh, Jennifer gave me a kiss. I love it. All right, I'm going to close my chat window down so it doesn't interfere with what you guys see. So um, this is a peek at the rubric. It is Appendix B, and it's called Appendix B Evaluation Criteria and Rubric, and that is in the Grant Guidelines document. And this rubric reflects the 2015-16 grant application questions. So if you're thoughtful in answering the questions that are in the grant applications questions section, um, you should score really well on um, the, the rubric. So um, the questions also were fine-tuned from last year with input from the FLC task force. We met several months ago um, just to talk about the rubric and um, the overall document. So um, this whole document has undergone um, a revision. And hopefully it's a little easier to use now and easier to understand as well as having great content in it. Um, one thing I would recommend is reading the rubric before you start answering the questions, just so you'll know how it's going to be scored. And then go ahead and write, do your write-up and, and get your grant stuff ready. And then before you submit it, um, it would be a really great idea um, to do a self-evaluation using the rubric or possibly pass it on for a peer evaluation. Maybe someone else in the group who wasn't um, as close to the writing process or maybe you could take it to your e-learning director if you're submitting an e-learning grant or, you know, somebody else that you like to bounce ideas off. Um, it's always great to get a second, third, and sometimes even a fourth pair of eyes and extra brain power um, into important documents like this. So I would really suggest doing some form of self or peer evaluation um, before you take the time to submit this. Um, We've really fine-tuned through this, and um, hopefully it's a lot easier to read, and um, hopefully it has the information in it that you need to um, make sure that you are covering everything in, um, in your writing process for your grant proposal. Jen, is there anything you'd like to add on the, on the rubric? Only to say that this is definitely a living document and that um, we spent a lot of time building careful criteria last year <clears throat> and then really trying to make an evaluative rub rubric and that the FLC task force and namely Alyssa's design skills really helped us, I think, make this a much more user-centered document. So thank you, Alyssa. Oh, you're welcome. It's um, it's two pages long now. It used to only be one page, but I think there's more white space on it now, and it's just a lot easier on the eyes. And I think we took out a lot of anything that was redundant and reorganized it. So um, hopefully it will be efficient for the evaluation of um, the grants when they come in, and I hope that you will all find it um, to be a valuable tool as you're preparing your grant packets for us. All right, let's come back to the whiteboard. Okay, there we are back at the whiteboard. And um, it's now time to turn it back over to Michelle, who's going to talk to us um, about preparing grant budgets. Okay, so um, one of the most important things um, regarding your grant budget is to work very, very closely, again, I said this earlier, but I'm going to say it again, work very closely with your college's grants and or business office on the grant application and the grant budget. Every college is a little bit different in terms of process, um, and it's likely there will be some kind of internal process that you have to follow, um, even if even if your college says it's okay for you to submit the grant application. Um, your your grants office or your business office is probably going to be a want to be involved in that budget development. Um, 
but it's also very likely that if you involve them, even if you don't have to, but if you but if you choose to involve them, um, they're going to help you write a really good grant budget, um, and and they may even do some of the work for you. Um, again, it all depends on your college, though. Uh, if you're not sure who that person who, who that person in your grant office or your business office would be, ask your OGMS security contact. If it's not that person, their problem chances are really, really, really good. They're going to know who you should connect with on that. Also, take a look at that uh, at your um, grant fiscal guidelines, and remember you can find those in the grant info section of the application. Those are also going to give you some good examples, um, as well as the, the requirements um, on anything that you, you have to put in your budget or anything you can't put in your budget. Um, keep in mind also that you can do budget revisions. If you get awarded a grant, um, you can do a budget revision to change your budget at any point during the, the grant period. Right now, when you submit your grant applications, you're going to submit your, your best guess at how you think you're going to spend your money. But if it's halfway through the grant period, like maybe next January, you realize that you don't actually need to buy as many books as you originally budgeted, but instead maybe you need more money for travel, um, maybe you're going to more professional development related to your FLC than you expected, or travel costs for hire, or whatever. Um, you can do a budget revision at that time to move money around. There are some parameters around budget revisions, and we'll go into more detail um, at a future point for um, FLCs that actually get awarded grants. And the fiscal guidelines do have some information as well. But for right now, I just want you to know that you don't have to stress too much about what about exactly what items you're going to put in your budget now, since you can. There is flexibility to change that um, after grants are awarded. So, content section eight um, on the next slide. Oh, oh, I can change those now. Um, content section eight has budget narrative questions. Not only do you have not only do you have to tell us how much money you think you're going to spend on different things, but you also have to tell us what those things might be. And and those things you put in the budget narrative section or content section eight. Um, you can enter your budget amounts either on this screen, on this, this narrative screen. And it's kind of small on the slide, but you'll see um, the, some, some of those darker gray boxes. Um, when there's like a big gray box and there's a couple of smaller gray boxes. Those are where you put your dollar amounts in and then you put your wording, your description on what you're going to, uh, to uh, what you're going to say in the bigger box. Um, you can actually enter your uh, dollar amounts on the budget matrix screen, which I'll show you in just a minute, or on this screen. They sort of auto-populate one from one screen to the other. So if you enter them or change them on one screen, they'll they'll either show up as entered or changed on the other screen as well. But you do have to enter your narrative on this screen. Um, if you're not awarding if you're not sorry, if you're not budgeting funds in a certain category, leave the narrative cell blank. So if you're not going to spend any money on like goods and services, leave the narrative blank. Don't try to type in like a not applicable or an NA or a none. Um, OGMS is actually programmed to make sure that you have a that you have to have a narrative for everywhere where you budget money, and you can only have a narrative where you're budgeting money. So here's the here's the budget matrix. Um, that you're going to see for this grant. You've got one budget line. It's all related to professional development for your FLC. But you have a bunch of uh, columns in the budget, and the columns are called categories. And I lost content on this slide. Um, that's okay. Salary and benefits is the is the first um, budget category that you can use. This is only for um, direct employees of your college, um, not any contractors that may that you, that you may use. Um, any contracts would get budgeted in the contract budget bill. Um, you can only budget small stipends for uh, FLC coordinators here, and there is an emphasis on small. Small or reasonable stipends might be like a couple hundred dollars. If there any more than that, you'd have to make a really good case for it. Um, and, and I'm not sure what a really good case would be because I don't think we've had any uh, anything like that yet. 
and funds can't be used uh, to pay for SLC participants. And I'm going to invite Jen to say, uh, to say a few words about that Thank right you. now. So we've received, um, there's a wide range of amounts that people perceive as small. And so when you're working with your budget, I think it's really important to think about intrinsic motivation and really spending your funds on things that will be inclusive and on things that won't benefit a small population or just one person of the FLC. That's how you're going to get people to come to meetings. Um, so spending money on food, for example, is highly appropriate because FLCs are not just about getting work done, they're also about building community. Um, you know, bringing in a speaker to talk to your group um, about whatever your topic is, that's motivating, that's um, exciting. Buying books that, that will not only uh, remain on at the college past the life of the FLC, but also be used to um, foster connection. Those are all really great ways to use your funds in ways that really foster that collective sense of we're doing this together and I'm a part of this and I'm important and I'm, I'm getting satisfaction from this. So right now at the State Board, we're working with faculty um, to think about uh, to working with, with, the, with the Institute for Systems Biology to think about um, instructional shifts that we might make uh, to incorporate a systems approach to undergraduate biology. We are working with two faculty members who are experts in the content field and also expert teachers and we're paying them $250 a quarter. So for me, um, you know, would I like to be able to give them release time? Would I like to be able to give them more luxurious stipends? Absolutely. But again, $5,000 is not a lot of money. So just really be judicious about how much money you spend on facilitation. Michelle, thank, thank you. you. Um, also, Michelle, Deb has a question about the fiscal guidelines. She said, if I remember correctly, the fiscal guidelines are linked to from the grant guidance document. And I guess I just wanted to say that we actually have the fiscal guidelines on the website. I don't think they're actually directly linked from the grant guidance. I don't think so either. And sometimes um, the documents on the web move around. So I don't think you really could use yeah. it in, but, but they are on the website. And, and like I mentioned earlier, they live on um, in OGMS, and um, they will also live in OBIS once the grant application becomes a grant. So there, there are many, many different places to access them. And you can always email me, and I'll send them to you, too. <laughs> <laughs> I put the link to the SBCT page, SBCTC page into Thanks the chat Alyssa. just now, and then That's you can perfect. click on the link to the grant guidelines from there. That's perfect. And we leave them up there all year, Deb, so um, you'll be able to access them. Thank you. Turn it. OK. Um, sorry, in the room that we're in right now, the AC is kicking on, and so it might get loud. Um, Hopefully not, but uh, it may. So goods and services is the next budget category, and this is where you're going to budget items that you're going to use in your FLC, mostly the tangible items like books or office supplies, or sometimes we've seen colleges need to buy like headsets um, so that they can meet electronically. Um, when you when you describe when you do your narrative for business services, it's okay to be a little generic. In fact, it's probably uh, to your benefit to be a little generic. You can say that you're going to purchase books. You don't actually have to give us the specific name of the book. If you name a specific book, then you have to purchase that specific book because a grant a grant is is a, is a type of contract, and so what you're telling us is what you're going to have to do, and we're going to hold you accountable to. Um, so like I said, if you name a specific book, you have to purchase that specific book. If you just say you'll buy books, that gives you some flexibility. That way you could buy one book or two books or red books or blue books or whatever. Um, 
it's also okay to say if you're going to buy office supplies. It's okay to say we're going to buy office supplies to support the FLC. You don't have to list every last office supply that you might buy, like pens or paper or staples or paper clips, or you get the idea. Um, please be aware, Jen sort of touched on it earlier, um, be aware that any non-consumable items must be retained by the college. Uh, non-consumable items are things like books or headsets or pretty much anything that isn't like, you know, pens or staples or paper clips. Um, the college has to retain those books or headsets or whatever it is that you buy. Individuals can certainly keep them in their offices and use them, um, but if those people leave the college, the books or the headsets or whatever it is um, has to remain with the college. Um, we had a question um, for some grant. It might have been an FLC grant. It might not have been. Um, somebody wanted to know if it was okay to buy T-shirts. Um, technically, yeah, but they have to. That's a non-consumable item, so it would have to be retained by the college. Um, and how do you know? Does the same person, somebody else, going to want to wear somebody else's used T-shirt, or does they are the sizes going to work, or something? So. So keep that in mind that the, the college actually, these are state funds and state rules say the college has to keep these things. Um, so keep that in mind when you're choosing what, what you might want to buy um, for your FLC. You're also going to budget services in that goods and services budget cell. Services include things like interagency agreements or your college might call them an interlocal agreement. And those are defined as contracts between two or more public entities like community or technical colleges. So maybe your FLC is going to be made up of faculty from a couple different colleges, um, and your college will agree to reimburse travel to a certain event for each of those participants. So it's possible that your college might want to set up an interagency or, or if you call it an interlocal agreement with the other colleges for that travel. Um, if that's the case and they set something up like that, make sure you budget that. Your college might call it a contract, and it, it is a type of contract, but it's a, technically an interagency or an interlocal agreement, and the state technically considers those services. Make sure you budget that in your service, in the goods and services budget itself. Again, though, if you work with your, your grants or your business office, they know rules like this, um, so they're going to help you uh, get that right. Uh, travel is the next budget category. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, the only reminder that I have for you is that all, all travel must follow all state travel rules and rates, um, as well as your college might have some internal travel processes, so make sure you, you know, again, just work closely with your college, make sure you're following all those rules. And travel is on there again. Contracts. Um, this is where you're going to budget um, probably where any uh, guest speakers might be. Uh, in rare instances, you might have a guest speaker from another college uh, where you're doing that as, a, as an interagency agreement, and then it would be goods and services. But, but um, probably any contractors, um, any individuals or private contractors you're going to have are going to go in there. Um, any rules that apply to your school as a grantee, um, any, any rules that apply to you also have to apply to the contract. Um, so if you are going to have a guest speaker and if you are going to pay them a speaking fee plus reimburse their travel, any travel rules that you have to follow, which are all the state travel rules, your contractor will also have to follow those. Um, so just be aware of that. And again, work closely with your business office because they will help with all of this. Um, when you're done with every part of your grant, you're going to you're going to want to submit it to the state board. If you don't submit it to us, we can't see it, we can't review it, and we certainly can't approve it. Um, so make sure that you uh, go to that submit tab when you're all done. Type in your name, your title, your phone number, or whoever's submitting the grant. Um, if it's somebody, you know, if it's somebody from your grant's office, they're they're the ones doing it. Um, you know, whatever's appropriate at your college. Type that information in. Click that submit button. And voila, your application has been submitted to the state board. We get a notification from OGMS when you submit your grant, so you don't have to call us or email us. Um, if you want to check to make sure that it really did get submitted, just click refresh on your screen, and the status on your end is going to change from in process to submitted. Um, the OGMS user manual has a couple of screenshots in there that will show you where you can find the status of your grant application so that you can check that out. 
If there aren't any boxes available to you for your name, title, and phone on this on the screen and, and maybe the submit button is grayed out. That means that means one of two things. That either means you haven't done everything in the application that somewhere something isn't spilled out, or maybe it's spilled out but you just didn't check that little check the mark is complete box at the bottom of the screen somewhere. So go back and make sure you have check marks across all of those um, items on your screen. If they all have check marks on them and everything's completed and you still don't have a submit button or boxes to type into, that means that you don't have proper permission to submit an application. Um, schools can can actually give you a permission to fill out a grant application but not submit it. That's a different level of uh, security in OGMS. Um, and sometimes sometimes that's an oversight by uh, an OGMS security administrator. They just forget to give you that permission. And sometimes it's by design because some colleges only have certain staff that can do that. Um, so at any rate, if you don't have a submit button available to you, check with your OGMS security contact um, to, to find out, you know, what the deal is, whether they just missed something or whether they're actually supposed to submit it for you or whatever the case is. Um, and after you submit your grant application, the state board, um, state board staff review them. Um, Jen and Alyssa and maybe some others review the content, and I review the budget. Um, they decide who's going to be funded. And then of those that are going to get funded, it's, it's entirely possible because budgets have to follow certain budget rules. And once in a while, we have some that even though they're fundable um, and that they're approvable and they, you know, a committee has determined they're going to be approved, um, once in a while, I need a couple of minor budget changes before they can ultimately be approved. It's usually something minor like, um, you just put something in the wrong box and we need you to move it. Maybe it's a contract that you accidentally put in salaries or something like that. Um, and that, when that's the case, we're going to enter feedback on the feedback uh, screen of your application. And you're going to get the, the contacts that were listed in your grant application are going to get an email that says that they, you know, the state board uh, returned your grant to follow up. Um, and then you're going to log in, or whoever at your college is going to log into OGMS and navigate to that feedback screen. Because the email that you're going to get is a pretty generic email. It's automated from the system. But when, but when you log in, go to that feedback screen, and that feedback screen is going to have notes from State Board staff that, that tell you what needs to be changed. Um, and we're going to say, it's going to be pretty specific feedback. I mean, we're going to say something like, um, you know, please make changes to eight to to question number 8B because blah, blah, blah. Um, or move whatever you put in 8B to 8A. Excuse me. Um, so in order to make those changes, um, the feedback screen is only viewable to you. You can't actually type anything into it. But you're going to go back to um, the specific question that we asked you to make changes to. Um, so if I asked you to make changes to 8B, you're going to go to content section 8. Locate question 8B and actually change the narrative right in that box. Um, so if I said, you know, can you give me a little bit more information on whatever, um, you're going to just add another sentence right in there wherever it's most appropriate. Um, you know, it might be right in the middle of a paragraph. You need to add another sentence. Go make changes right in that narrative itself. Um, make sure when you're done um, that you scroll to the bottom of whatever screen you made changes to. Click the Save button again to save those changes. Then you're going to go right back to that Submit tab, and you're going to click the Submit button again to submit your changes right back to the state form. One thing I didn't mention anywhere uh, in the budget stuff uh, that I kind of need to mention is um, I, I think elsewhere in your application, you're going to – you, you – uh, put in uh, names of your FLC members. In your budget narratives themselves, we don't want to see names. Um, your, your budgets live on if a grant is approved. Um, and it's, you know, with public records requests, um, we just like to keep 
names out of budgets as much as we can to help protect people. But also, if there was staff turnover, um, we don't want you to have to do a budget amendment to change a name and a budget if it's just a simple staff turnover issue or something like that. So anyway, just just remember, try and remember to keep um, names out of budgets. If not, I'll send you feedback and remind you to say, hey, take, take that out of your budget. It's not something you're going to get an application denied um, over that. So I, uh, that's it for um, OGMS and for fiscal stuff. So I will turn it back over to uh, Jenna and Alyssa. All right. So we have about 15 minutes left. And so do people have questions? I, I heard a hand go up, Alyssa. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was more fun. I'm, I'm modeling the behavior. Oh, good. Um, oh, good. So um, I just wanted to mention that um, it's not Jen and I personally who decide which grants are funded or not funded. They're actually good reviewed call. by a committee. So um, there will be several people reading the grants over. And once the grants are come into um, us, they're actually divided into assessment, teaching, and learning based grants and e-learning grants. So the e-learning grants will come to me and um, I'll be answering questions for those and then um, the e-learning team will help read through those and score the rubrics and we'll use the rubric to decide. Um, you know, how how the funding goes. And then the same will happen for Jennifer. She'll get the ATL-based um, grants. Um, she'll go through it with a committee. They'll be scored on a rubric. Um, so that's kind of the, the behind the scenes process on that. Jenna, do you want to add to that? Um, yes. I, I was just going to say that for the ATL <laughs> ones, no, 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 no. For the ATL ones, we'll be um, doing a blind screen screening, and I'm still working out the logistics of that. But um, I'm probably going to ask people who are experienced FLC facilitators to score, and then um, and then we'll we'll have a for for splits. We'll have a deciding person weigh in. So I'm still working out the logistics of that. So whatever protocol Jennifer so Deb, follows, um, uh, the e-learning oh, yeah. guide will follow as well. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Perfect. Yeah, we're, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think of a process that would be similar to how we screen the, um, the ATL conference submissions because it's remarkably efficient, <laughs> um, which relates to Deb's question about how many applications are submitted each year and how many are funded. And Deb, um, the answer is every year it grows. But the last two years I have done this process, um, we have received, I want to say, about 45 when we, when we take to all together the ATL ones and the e-learning, like around that, that number. And we're able to fund about 15. So generally 10 ATL and about 5 e-learning. Yes, it's very, very competitive. <laughs> and so, Deb, one thing that I've been thinking about a lot is how do I find some funds? Like, first of all, how do I show that, that this investment in faculty professional development directly impacts student learning and improves it? And then how do I turn to funders to get more funds? <laughs> Just so you know, I'm because I would like to see more of these. And I'd also like to figure out a way to pay really experienced FLC facilitators like Mark, for example, um, to mentor other faculty and check in with them because right now, my entire job and Alyssa's entire job could be just running these FLCs. Like, I think they're super effective and wonderful. Um, so Hera said, when is the next FLC facilitator training? And that is uh, going to be September 9th and 10th. And, that, and we're, we're just going to offer one. Um, and then we'll probably have, that will be mandatory, but then we'll have other sort of um, 
what was I going to say? Uh, I'm very, it's, it's hard to read the chat because it's so fun <laughs> and stay focused. <laughs> um, I was just going to say that uh, um, we'll also offer like sort of mini um, opportunities for the FLCs to gather, um, for the FLC facilitators to gather on topics that we think would be of interest to them. And Deb wrote, EGADS, Hara and I thought that was your total job by the description of all that has to be done. I know, right? It's why I feel a little crazy sometimes. <laughs> um, but these, you know, when I think about professional development and when I think about really growing um, faculty leaders and when I think about, you know, giving faculty time and space in for, for deep and sustained learning and to solve instructional problems in ways that are not sabbatical, you know, because clearly like at the State Board we can't, we can't provide people with sabbaticals, but what are some vehicles we can use that would give faculty time and space to really do some deep learning that will be rejuvenative, that would allow young faculty to interact with older faculty in a way that's um, beneficial for both populations. I mean, FLCs have, they're such a flexible and adaptable structure. They could be used to do policy work. They can be used to do curriculum design. I know, Deb, I hear you. You so want, I know, that time to do that meaningful, deeper work. And, that, and that's why I think this training is going to be really important because I think if the FLCs are facilitated um, well and, and implemented well, they can create that space for that meaningful, deeper work. And then if they're not, they can feel like more work on top of what you already have to do. <laughs> so I've been thinking a lot about that art slash science of them. But I also think I'm also highly encouraging of, sab of sabbaticals <laughs> as well. Um, other other questions? I'll just make a comment, Jen. I'm um, putting the PowerPoint into the um, file transfer library. So everyone should be seeing a link to download that as soon as it loads. It's going to take a minute, though, because it's kind of big. OK. Yep. Thank you. Um, any, anything else that um, are, is of interest or that people want to explore? Um, if not, uh, Beth, Bridget, Deb, Hera, Jim, Thank you so much for coming. Um, we really appreciate your time and your questions and your attention. And we very much look forward to seeing your applications. <laughs> Beth says, I have some reading to do. <laughs> Absolutely. And don't hesitate to contact Alyssa. Um, if you're applying for an e-learning application, don't hesitate to contact Alyssa. And if you're applying for an ATL, um, don't hesitate to contact me and we are the Wonder Twins so you could just send us one email and you know and that's fine which is the both of us but we'd really like to just be available oh and Alyssa says hang out for a second if you want a copy of the PowerPoint it's 70 percent loaded <laughs> and then you can see our beautiful graphics or Alyssa's beautiful graphics she really did she spent a lot of time formatting this so it would be very, very user-centered and the equivalent of walking into a well-decorated room. <laughs> so Alyssa, thanks for your time um, and effort on that project. You're very welcome. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Um, thank you again.